I really do like to visit your lab. It's very interesting. You're doing some really interesting work and I'm gonna get into that a little bit. Obviously, you know, you were going through these really wonderful universities and, and we're talking Duke and Harvard and, and, you know, your university in Portugal where you're from. Um, at what point as you're going through it, whether it was through your training or maybe growing up as a, as a kid, when did you decide that you wanted to make science your, your career? Um, yes, Lonnie. So I think I remember saying I wanted to be a scientist since I was very young. Um, I think I became, I always, you know, had became amazed by all these, uh, by, by nature, um, all these shapes, different shapes, um, patterns, um, uh, transformations in nature. Uh, so I basically fell a lot in love with, uh, with biology. Um, later on, it was not just appreciation of, you know, of the beauty of nature, but also trying to understand, you know, how it works, how it comes to be. So it was more of a mechanistic kind of question. Um, mm. So that, that's how, so I, I think I, you know, being a scientist or being a, a researcher is this constant quest or pursuit for, for answers to questions. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really um, a big drive for me. Well, you know, it, I, that's, that's, a, that's an interesting perspective. It's certainly, it, it, it is the quest for answers, but it's, and it's just a, a passion to try to really dig in and, and, um, and, and understand how things work. So, you know, and what you're doing is really very specialized because we have, you know, we have a, a team of scientists that are working in the back of the eye, they're working in the retina, but you're specifically working in the fovea. So um, I, I, I know you have some slides with you, which may be helpful in kind of telling us a little bit about your research. So let's, let's get into those and talk a little bit about your research. Yes, absolutely, Lonnie. So I really, um, you know, I really became, um, um, I became passionate about um, our visual system, our, you know, we are highly visual um, as humans. Um, and we, you know, our sense of vision, our high acuity, um, it's actually owed to this, you know, as you mentioned, this the fovea region in the in the back of the eye. Um, so I'm um, jumping on this slide. So the neural retina, I highlighted in yellow here. It's this um, all this neural tissue lining the back of the eye, and the fovea. It's actually this small highly specialized area of the retina. Uh, it's less than 1% of the total retina surface. It's characterized, it has this pit, um, it has this um, depression on the retina surface, um, but it's, it's actually, it's very important. It's responsible for our sharp vision. Uh, and actually most of the tasks that we perform daily uh, are actually you know, um, owed to the presence of this fovea region in our retina. So fovea is responsible for our ability to read, um, for instance, to drive uh, and recognizing faces. Uh, so I became you know, uh, very interested. Again, I really, you know, our sense of vision, it was really a passion for me. Uh, I'm a developmental biologist. So the question was really trying to understand how you form um, the retina and specifically, how do you form this highly, uh, how do you obtain this highly specialized area located in the center of the retina that is responsible for our, you know, high acuity, sharp uh, sense of vision. Wow, and, and so it's really just a small, small collection of cells, but they're responsible for the sharp vision. So we, if, if, we, if we have damaged cells in our phobia, can we read? Uh, no, that's 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 a thing. So, um, as you know, as I mentioned, uh, as you mentioned, any any detriment to this area can really have a huge impact um, in our sense of vision, uh, in our ability to perform those tasks. Uh, and I'm showing you here. It's an example of um, uh, a patient. This is a fundus image of his eye. This patient uh, is suffering from age-related macular degeneration. So it's a disease that specifically, it's a degenerative disease that specifically affects the macula with, you know, uh, where the fovea is actually located. So um, it's part of the macula. It's a little section of the macula. 
Yes, yes. It's actually in the center of the macula. Wow. Wow. So, so, uh, so you, you're, you're looking at this in, in, in a model, uh, an animal model. That's true. That's true, Lonnie. So I just mentioned, so we know, you know, how important that is uh, mm -hmm. for our, right, functionally, how important it is for our uh, sense of vision. Uh, we know a few, you know, features, um, cell are features that define this fovea. Uh, for instance, it's just a, it's enriching cones, and these are the light sensing photoreceptors uh, working during um, daylight conditions. Uh, also, there's a high density, uh, many ganglion cells. Uh, there's a specific circuitry in this, in this region, and all of these are responsible for that, you know, function of high acuity. Um, so we know a lot about this. What we don't know much about is how do you actually uh, basically acquire this phobia, all of these cellular specializations uh, during development, and where are the genes and signaling pathways, or are the molecular mechanisms operating during development that leads to this specialization? And the, um, a major contributing factor for that is that um, the most common laboratory model systems that we have uh, in the lab, people use like mice and zebrafish, they do not have a phobia. Uh, so actually oh. all, among mammals, only primates have a phobia. So to try to get at that you know, question, how do you form a phobia? What are the genes? What are the molecular pathways uh, operating during development um, that are responsible for formation of this specialized area? We, we turn to a species um, that um, actually has a fovea, has an equivalent area um, like the human fovea, and was a bird species. Wow. Uh, so All birds have fovias? Most of them. You even have birds like um, eagles and hawks, birds of prey, that have two fovias per eye. Wow. Highly visual. Yes, highly visual. And they need that to see the, the, you know, the, the rodents from, you know, way up in the air. Wow. Exactly. Exactly. For prey capture. Yes. Um, All right. So, so uh, is this, so it, this relates obviously to any kind of disease in the retina, macular degeneration. How about things like retinitis pigmentosa? So in retinitis pigmentosa, uh, it's actually, uh, you have, you know, the first portion of the, the retina to be affected, it's actually the peripheral, okay. the peripheral retina. Um, so it's, it's the rods and you start by having, uh, you know, you losing your night vision uh, and eventually, uh, it's a progressive disease as well, eventually the death of these rods, which are the other type of uh, photoreceptors, uh, they will affect um, the cone. So eventually you do, you do lose also um, vision coming from the cones. Okay. Well, it, very interesting. And, and what have you, you know, um, any exciting findings to date that you've, that you've, you know, learned about the phobia that, that, uh, that you'd like to share? Yes, absolutely. And I think there was kind of my, um, uh, major contribution, I'd say, um, to the field, and you know, I'm just starting my my own lab as independent. Uh, but uh, you know, kind of a big accomplishment um, uh, that we actually made. Uh, it was during my uh, postdoctoral um, training in the laboratory of Dr. Carney Sepko at Harvard, um, and we again using the chick uh, as a model system embryos, uh, we were able to reveal. Uh, you know, for the first time, a molecular mechanism that was responsible for the formation of the cheek um, fovea, the cheek high acuity. Um, so this was uh, really, um, you know, it was a breakthrough in the field. Um, what was more interesting, it was a key finding, was that we asked if the same mechanism that uh, happens in the cheek could be also uh, happening in the human. Uh, retina, uh, so we were able to find uh, some fetal human tissue, and indeed we confirmed that the same mechanism that we found was operating during the cheek development, it seems to be conserved in humans. Um, okay. And this is a finding that has been um, verified by others, uh, you know, following, uh, following up our initial discovery. Um, so this is really exciting to us. Well, um, I can imagine. Uh, and, and 
I actually maybe we'll stop sharing your screen for uh, for the rest of our our talk together. Uh, but thank you. Um, so if I was to say that sounds like a pretty proud accomplishment, do you think that's that's what you're most proud of as far as what you've done in science to date? Uh, yes, yes, I, I do, uh, uh, Lonnie. So I, so that finding, um, so it was very important. It validated the chick also as a model system uh, that we can we can learn things in chick. Um, it's a, an attainable model system. We can uh, have it in the lab. We actually just every, all the work we do, we, we work um, inside the egg. So we just have the embryos, um, and we can uh, we can actually. Uh, then really translate that it has direct implications for human development, mm -hmm. um, which was great. Uh, and it really allow us to identify, you know, the first molecular identity of that early human um, phobia region in the retina. Um, so you're, you've decided to take this incredible science that you're doing at Harvard and to come to Pittsburgh and, um, and work with our team here in Pittsburgh. Tell me some of the factors that really are um, exciting to you or are important to you in terms of what you want to accomplish in, uh, in, in your work in the fovea. Uh, so, yeah, so I'm very proud. I'm really happy to be here, part of the team. Um, so um, I became aware that Dr. Sahel um, had uh, recently uh, moved to, to USA. Uh, had become the director of the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, and that kind of you know, sparkled um, my interest. Um, I was um, aware of Dr. Sahel's work, uh, not just in the clinical field, but also his contributions to the basic research. And I knew how much he value uh, this you know, basic research, which is what I do. Um, mm -hmm. And then of course, uh, with strong implications for uh, human health. Mm -hmm. um, so when I visited, uh, it was it was really amazing uh, getting to know uh, Dr. Sahel, Dr. Jeff Gross, all the faculty uh, here um, in the department. Uh, in particular, all the new uh, hires here, all the new young um, outstanding investigators. So there was really this vibrant energy, uh, motivation, um, and the collaborative environment that I you know really make me be sure that I would like to be part of this team. Uh, and I'm really glad to be, to be here now. So, you know, there's, a, there's been a lot of growth, a lot of new people. There's a lot of plans for the future in terms of the department, but also where we'll be living in a new facility and so forth. But it, it, what are the things we should be, or you would be excited about and that you hope to be able to accomplish with your science and, and looking forward in these next coming years? Yes, so it's really great. So again, you know, the, um, our key findings, you know, my key findings during my postdoc training um, in Dr. Sepka's lab, it's really the foundation of you know, my, uh, my research here as an independent uh, group leader. Um, and uh, Lonnie, I really think we, this is a great time um, to, be, you know, to be in this field and really try to get at this answer, you know, how do you form a phobia? Um, there's a, you know, it, it's a combination uh, of technological advances also uh, made um, in the last couple of years. Uh, genomic, you know, this uh, high throughput, deep sequencing, um, DNA sequencing um, at the single cell resolution um, combined uh, with, you know, recent um, tools, molecular tools for genome editing uh, that allow us to do, you know, easy gene manipulations um, in cheek, uh, in cheek embryos, uh, and then uh, also uh, really excited. Something that I'm um, establishing in my lab, it's the um, this explosion uh, and these really um, advances on an in, um, in vitro system where you can actually grow uh, these mini retinas, 3D retinal organoids that can be grown from human uh, stem cells. Okay, we can actually grow them. Uh, in a petri dish, in a multi-well um, uh, plate, um, uh, in vitro, in our lab, uh, and this really allows, really, you know, establishing uh, model systems, uh, a new model system where you can actually, uh, you know, perform. It's a platform to do uh, drug screening, um, uh, basically get at uh, 
trying to understand genetic basis of uh, some uh, potential genes implicated um, mm -hmm. in human diseases, foveal diseases, uh, or even just you know, as a source of uh, cells, human cells that can eventually be transplanted. Oh, wow. Patients. That's, that's incredibly yeah. exciting. And it's certainly something that, you know, um, you know, you're working in a field where, uh, un, you know, for unfortunate circumstances, a lot of people lose, lose their vision uh, specifically from these conditions that affect the, the retina, particularly the macula and the fovea. So uh, I hope we, uh, 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 you know, accomplished our goal here getting to know you. I, I, it's been a, uh, you know, it, it's always a pleasure to see you but also um, maybe training and teaching some people a little bit about the fovea today. So it's something new. So thank you for spending some time with us. Thank you for coming to Pittsburgh. Thank you for doing the work that you do to try to, again, advance the science so we can improve people's vision for the future. Thank you and have a, you know, um, look forward to more. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Always you a pleasure. Care.